Hey everyone, welcome to Limitless Radio Cast, episode 47. Sit back and relax. We got the OG Mike Fowler in the house today talking 880 mile walk through Japan, how he got his black belt in three and a half years, jujitsu in life. Enjoy the show and support our sponsors because they support us to bring this show each and every week. Chad and I would appreciate it a great deal if you'd go out to RollAmongUs.com, True Tubes Tattoo Supply, Magic City Brewing Company located in Akron, Ohio, and also BattleBomb.com. By supporting those sponsors, you support the Limitless Radiocast podcast, and we appreciate it very much. It helps Chad and I bring content each and every week. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Yo, everybody, welcome to the show. Hope all you guys are doing well and staying staying safe out there, especially if you're in uh, Northeast Ohio, because we got dumped on major, major snow. snow. But our awesome guest that we have hanging out with us today, he has no snow because of where he's located, out in Hawaii. It's probably very nice and, and not cold at all, and I'm a little jealous. But anyway, it's go ahead, Mike. You're good. It's 78 degrees cold. <laughs> uh, cold that's not cold at all <laughs> it's uh, not cold man so mike thanks for joining us man appreciate it so much uh mike is a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt under lloyd Irvin, and he also has won ibjjf tournaments he's a he's a american national champion an asian open champion a pan-american silver medalist and one of the uh, he has huge notable uh wins over henzo gracie and i'm gonna screw this name up Salo Ribeiro. Yep. Yes. Okay. See, I'm getting better at this. And <laughs> one of the greatest things that I think Mike has ever did is walked 880 miles across Japan and visited 108 temples. I'm huge into Asian culture as uh, someone who loves martial arts typically is. And I'm sure we'll get into that and everything, man. So Mike Fowler, thanks so much for joining us, man. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me on. For sure, man. For sure. So yeah. Uh, I'm sure this, I, I just kind of want to know, like, what's it take to do an 880 mile walk? <laughs> um, you know, uh, depending on, uh, it just depends on who you are and what's going on in your life, to be honest. Um, sure. I mean, obviously if you're in Japan, it's a little easier to access this, um, this, this hike. It's an Island on the bottom of Japan. And uh, that trail normally is like, I think, 700 and some change of miles. And you do 88 temples, which are all sacred numbers. And then the extra temples, the 20 extra for the 108 is like um, they're not, nor which is real strange to me. Those were more famous temples with real like more history, yet they weren't the more popular ones to go to. They're off the beaten path. And so I did the full 880 where I, you know, did the normal regular path but i would go sure. off and and so, see those as well nice yeah, yeah, so it'd be yeah. Like, I think after temple five you would go to the first like special temple and then you go six seven uh, eight okay special temple and then so it was kind of like that and sometimes they were right on the path other times they were i have no idea what the equation is but they'd be 14 kilometers 15 you know something like sure, that sure yeah yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I it was, I was so intrigued, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm always talking on the show. Like if you're doing a podcast, man, research your guest, <laughs> like go out and like <laughs> talk about your guest or, you know, read about your guests and whatnot. When I saw that, I was like, Ooh, I'm like, we're yeah. Sorry, Chad. We're not talking about jujitsu. We're just going to talk about we'll get it. There. I'm we'll just get kidding. There. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so that's it, you know, for what, so I, Mike, I started jujitsu in 2004. So I kind of, I didn't have to research you that much because you were kind of one of the guys right. on the scene when I started, right? Especially yep. Ameri American guys. So, you know, I watched a lot of your matches and, you know, that's what, one of my big questions is how how did it feel to beat Henzo and Salo in the same event? Um, that Crazy. whole event, <laughs> well, it was just, the whole event was surreal because, um, so, it, I mean, it's, you know, there's so much to the story in essence, but before that point, when I was training with Lloyd to get my black belt, I had already started to get the sense of like, I needed something outside of life. Like I didn't sure. like, I love jujitsu, I love competition, but I just didn't enjoy being, um, uh, in those, you know, in that, in those four walls every day. Like mm -hmm. I loved it. There was more out there. So I didn't know if I should go to college, if I should do, you know, what it was, but I knew I needed to, I knew I was going to be out. And so then, um, uh, in I think 2005, right after I got my black belt, I, um, you know, just kind of started that habit of, just, you know, or just that path of just kind of being on the, being on the move. 
And so I had art in my mind. I wasn't done with competition by any means. So the, there was a, a very critical match in 2006 where um, I had already left Lloyd's, but I went, we went to the world championships in Brazil. And at that time, um, uh, you know, the, the champions were Marcelo Garcia, um, Danny Marias, Marcia Potosa, mm-hmm. uh, Pedade was still competing at these times. And so it was, you know, the, the world was awesome. It was just yeah. amazing to just, you know, visit and see. And so, um, what do you call it? I, uh, I had this match with Daniel. He got uh, Danny Marias. He took me down. He got a nice little duck under. And then I locked him up in an arm lock. And being the nice guy that I am, I didn't want to hurt him. I mean, right. I put the arm on, but I'm not trying to break your arm, dude. And sure, when yeah. I finished that arm lock, he spiked me on my head and uh, the referee chose to ignore it. And uh, it just uh, long story, like they ended up saying they gave me an apology. I never received an apology, but they, uh, you know, at this time there was only like what, four tournaments in Brazil a year. And they're like, Oh, we'll suspend the referee for three months. Like, what's that? There was <laughs> yeah. no tournament. Yeah. It wouldn't and matter. So, <laughs> but they did have to start putting in more referees. So now, now you, now that's, a big part of why you have to have multiple referees for the black belt matches, because I don't think people are cheating is necessarily like that. That's not, I just feel you need the other two to check because sometimes it is exciting. You forget to look at something or you forget to, you know, or you just, you know, you're in awe, whatever it might be. So I, I, but that had already happened and it didn't take away my love for jujitsu by any means, but it did kind of put a dampener on my competition, like love, because it, it kind of gave me the feeling like, doesn't matter how hard I train, how good I eat, all I put everything in line. I couldn't prepare for the referee to fuck me over. Oh, excuse me, pause. Oh, you're and good. I, you're good, man. And I couldn't, prepare, you know, I couldn't prepare for the slam or any of that. You know, it was just things yeah. were out of control. And so it's like, man, why am I putting so much into this when there ain't? It's it's not, you know, it's not a definite. And so, uh, and then not to mention, you know, that was also um, the first time I had really started seeing like uh, a little bit of the rise of the uh, the, the steroid use. And mm. so he had that question on my mind. It's like, what kind of like I'm not against that. I don't necessarily care if you do steroids. But my issue is for me personally, if I look back and know that I cheated to win any of those matches, it's going to always linger in the back of my head. I don't I don't have yeah. to worry about it ever. Ooh. You know, it's a, I knew, I knew everything I accomplished was me. And I'm not saying that steroids isn't still those people. Like, it's just, I don't have, I'm not that kind of a champion. You know what I mean? If, I, if that's what it takes to be a champion in, in our art right now, I'm not that guy. You know what I mean? That's yeah. just, sure, I'm not yeah. Well. yeah. And I enjoy watching it and I, I love the matches. Like, it's like, I, to be honest, I can care less what you do. Like it was in my mind, it's kind of, I would like, if I get a chance to go against you, I want to win so I can, you know, let's make that. I want to see natural beat. I, you know, it doesn't bother me as far as I don't feel like you cheated to win. It's just, that's something I'm not willing to do to get an edge. I'm also not willing to poke you in the eye. Do other, you know what I mean? Right. A, you know, yeah. Sure, yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, that came to a part. And then, um, as, uh, it came on to 2000, what else happened in 2006? The, uh, I did the USA trials. And for the Abu, for Abu, you know, for the ADCC, and I ended up losing to Vocek in the finals uh, by a back take. It was a good match, and um, I was second place. And then I heard—I didn't know if it was true—but I had heard that they were taking Vocek. Obviously, he won, but I heard they were also taking Drew Fickett. And I know Drew had fought UFC, but I was like a little like uh, not insulted, but like I was hurt. I was like, "Y'all gonna take?" This, just because he has a name in UFC and I placed higher, I took second. You're gonna put, you're gonna take a guy who got knocked out third round or whatever it was, and it was just yeah. like. So I, in my mind, I was kind of just I'm taking a break from competition, uh, not competing, but just making my focus. And so then in 2007, I was sitting at the bar. Uh, I was in Guam, and um, I really don't drink, but I was drinking, and uh, I got a text from Lloyd saying, or he, he called me up and he's like, "Hey, you know, like." what are you doing right now? I'm like, Oh, I'm at a bar. I'm just hanging out. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't like it was some loud, massive scene. It was just guys cruising. It was, you know, nothing, you know, not, not any, uh, you know, didn't have to cover up my ear to hear him or anything. <laughs> and he was like, Hey, well, you know, they got a spot open for you, uh, or, you know, for the ADCC and they just, they just got a hold of me to see if you can go. And I'm like, you mean the one, and this is, a, this is Thursday in Guam. So it's what 
maybe what Wednesday in East Coast where Lloyd was. And I'm like, Thursday in Guam, you want me to get on a plane before Saturday in my mind? You know what I mean? Like, how's this all work out? And so I'm like, mm, y'all can last. Like, what about Mike Easton? And so I hung up the phone and Lloyd, you know, and I, and I didn't know if that was it. He's like, I'll call you back. And so then he called me back in like 10 minutes and he was like, listen, they're going to get your ticket. You're going to leave at four in the morning. You're going to make it right in time for weigh-ins, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, oh shit. Okay. I guess I'm going. So I went, I, like I said, I was drinking a little bit. So I just stopped at a ramen shop that's open like all night and had some ramen and just kind of got myself together, went home, packed, I think like took an, you know, like what, not even an hour nap and then made my way to the airport, which Guam, you know, not, thank goodness, isn't very, uh, it's not very big. So it didn't take too long to get there. And, um, took that long ass flight all the way to the East coast and, uh, landed in New York, uh, or Jersey. Um, really surprised too. I, my, by the way, why Trenton, New Jersey for 2080 C's, 2007, <laughs> I, that part really bothered me a lot. I'm like, man, it's Paulo. You know, Barcelona, yeah, <laughs> beautiful places, Rio de Janeiro, and we're gonna go to fucking Trenton. Yeah, and so I I get there and uh, I show up to weigh-ins, and for just you know the jujitsu god smiling upon me, I was on weight. I didn't have to cut a single thing. I was just there on weight. Wow, and nice. so wonderful. And uh, I had seen Henzo jogging when i arrived with sweats on so how much he was over i don't know but i do know he was over and um i had not you know i just had you know that night i just had you know i or being a, you know when i got the phone call i was drinking i had ramen i'm like i'm not about to go eat healthy now right. so i went to a little diner I had, I had lasagna and chocolate milk i still remember that and, uh, you know, I, I forgot which group of guys kind of called me over and we, you know, chit chatted with some other, you know, the grapplers there and, um, you know, just, and I mean, they were, they were tripping out. They're like lasagna and chocolate milk. Like, whoa. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and so then when I get back, they're like, they've released the brackets and they're like, what somebody, I don't know who it was. I couldn't tell you who I want to say for some reason, I want to say it was like, um, this one guy, Emilio Novoa, I feel like he was there, but. He, uh, I just remember they're like, all right, well, first round, you got Henzo. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> they're like, if you get past Henzo, probably have Salo. And it's like, oh, okay. And then, like, if you get past Salo, you definitely have Marcelo. And it's like, oh, God. And so it's just boom, boom. And, um, and that was it. Just, I hung out. I did my little warm up. I, you know, I, I wish I would just sleep usually and try to pretend like I'm touching my toes. And, uh, <laughs> I, I go out there with Henzo and when we tie up and I pull guard, uh, you know, I'm not at this point, I'm only what, like six years in, but enough to feel when someone has been cutting weight, you know? Um, yeah. So I know when I, so that was not the best Henzo. Yeah. Um, I didn't even think I was really going to get the win. I did put him in danger. I put him in triangle, like not triangle, like my legs locked around head and arm. Uh, I put him in Uma Plata and repeatedly was putting him in these positions. But um, I think because he was just so tired, he really didn't have too much oomph to, you know, put safely into guard passing. And so the match ended in my guard. And uh, I really was just like, oh, that was cool. I got to come fight Henzo. I get to go home now. And I remember Mo uh, from ADCC nodding towards me. And it was like, oh, was that shit towards me? <laughs> oh, shit. And then I raised my hand. And it, to be honest, it was – it was uh it didn't feel like that big of a deal just because it was just lackluster you know i mean the match yeah. wasn't too uh too boring it just i knew i didn't like i didn't beat henzo but i did get to move on in the tournament i did get to exp i did get to go with one of my heroes which was just awesome and um you know so i mean it, the match was all win 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 for me um and so then you know now i'm preparing for solo now, the history with Salo at this point, which is fun. Um, in 2006, I was living in San Diego teaching at City Boxing. And um, God rest his soul, the owner of that gym, uh, we didn't get along. Uh, it wasn't really any of me and him. He and Brandon Vera had their issues because I was living there purely because I love Brandon. and I wanted to help him out. And, um, and the owners, like, you know, strife with Brandon would stretch over to me just because I was, a, you know, I was his friend. I was a jiu-jitsu instructor. I was right. I, we were both employees. 
And uh, it got to the point where it's like, I've never, I've never quit like a job like jujitsu teaching wise before. So that was like, it was just something weird. And I put the, I put it on speakerphone when he was just kind of getting, a, you know, irate with me. And I let the class hear it. Like, look, this is, this is what I'm dealing with. And I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And so I up the phone with him. I told him to please come meet me as soon as class is done. Um, we waited over two hours, me and the class waited for him to show up because this is also their future. Where are they going to go? And I told him, I was like, so he didn't show up. And so uh, I took the class and I told him, I was like, obviously you can see where this guy, you know, what, he, what we mean to him. Well, I'm not staying here. Neither is Brandon Vera. And you're not supposed to know that, but, uh, uh, I'm out. I don't have anywhere to go. Brandon was my reason I was here. And if he's not going to be here, I don't have a job. And so uh, I'm not going to just leave you guys, but I'm not going to be here. So I told him, let's go to some other gyms. So we took the next few weeks and we went to the the other gyms in San Diego. We went um, mainly I asked them where they wanted to go. And the group that wanted to go to Undisputed with Barrett Yoshida, which I recommended as well, because I love Barrett. Um, we went and did a group there and then about 20 something of them all wanted to go to Salos because him and Shanji were opening up the, the university there in San Diego was just opening. And so I took a group there. And so for the next few weeks, I trained there as well with Salo and Shanji. And I mean, it was funny at one point we bow in class and Shanji would look over at me. He's like, man, do you want to teach? These are all your guys. <laughs> I really, I, I, start their gym by any means but i just did bring a big chunk of students right when they opened their so like they just had automatic classes and um which is you know fantastic they you know that was uh they got those guys you know they found a new home with uh with people i trust in jujitsu so now i'm fighting solo this is only what within a year later you know so it's like oh this feels weird you know the you know that i'm not weird with it but i can just tell there's some you know, it's like, oh, we trained and now we're going to fight. So cool. And I expected him for him to beat the piss out of me, which he started to because, um, man, he just made me feel like a little kid when I trained with him. He would just do whatever he want and laugh at me. And I mean, it was just felt like my dad was rolling with me. Um, but we started that match. We shook hands. Um, I don't remember how the, the guard pull, whatever the hell he did work, but it, he took my back so fast. And at one point I had popped my knee saying me that I popped again just now. <laughs> So if you watch the match, you see my back get taken and you see me kind of chill out for a second. And that's me trying to get myself together because my knee is throbbing. I need, you know, it wasn't that bad of a pop, but it's one I need this throbbing to go away so I can kind of function again. And he's trying to choke me. And so uh, he keeps digging that choke in. Um, the referee was being a little bit irritating. He's I've got two hands in defending a rear naked. Referee tells me I need a thumbs up or I'm calling the match. Excuse me. Like wow. I've got two you know, thumbs up, like in my mind, like you yeah yeah for sure you know what i mean i I give him a quick one i'll put my hands back and so i'm just now i'm like oh you know i'm now i'm like a little bit heated but then the 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 thing that we've all felt that you train is when someone squeezes for that choke and the pressure laxes you're like oh the arms burned (laughs) and every time solo squeezed after that point his arms got like looser and looser until i just peeled those bad boys off turned around and just started, you know, doing, you know, opening his guard, passing, and then just going, you know, I'm going to, you know, now I'm going to win this match. You know, I, I'm not going to get out of this. Ooh, show. Yeah. And so at one point of the match, he, uh, he keeps going for my feet. And so I go to like, almost like a reverse knee on belly type position and he grabs my foot and he puts his feet up. So I grab his foot and I'm not having any torque, like nothing's, you know, but then he uses his other foot and I don't know what happened. Like it wasn't, it must've just been like the perfect alignment. I didn't even crank, but as soon as I grabbed the other foot and put the toe hold on his, it just crumbled like Ooh. graham crack. I was like, Ugh. <laughs> and so that one, I got up shaking like, Oh shit. You just tap solo. Like, off. Oh. you know what I mean? Now, mm-hmm. the, now the nerves kicked in the, Ooh, you know, like it was like real, like a uh, real rush of, of, of just everything at that yeah. point. So, one that I really kind of, you know, just it, it whether whether I, you know, and from that point on, win or lose, it was like I belong. I belong with these dudes, and um, and so then the next day was uh, was Marcelo, and then our, uh, Andre, and I had fought Andre previously at the Pan Ams. Um, that was the silver medal one in two thousand six. Uh, 
completely, when I fought him, completely oblivious that I would be fighting Andre Galvao. I was actually <laughs> outside of the gym, just wandering around, having a good time. And then I hear my name and they say that I'm about to be DQ'd. Uh-huh. So I run to the desk with my acai. I'm like, do I? I'm like, yo, I'm here. Like, why am I going to be DQ'd? They're like, you're in the finals. I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, that's good, yeah, good for me. Uh, with who? <laughs> They're like, Andre. And he's already out <laughs> bouncing up and down. And I was like, oh, shit. I just, I mean, I can tell you how many times I threw up in my mouth in that match, just freaked the fuck out that the guy that I always watch just whip everybody's ass. And now I'm standing across, you know, I'm fighting him now. Yeah. I was really just so shell shocked. He just beat the piss out of me. I I think he got some kind of baseball bat or some kind of cross choke from Neon Belly. Like I just, I, I had nothing for him. I was just, I was just so caught off guard and I think mentally not ready for that kind of a match. Mm. Uh, you know, it's like, I, not, I would always get to see these guys, but I had very little experience going with them. You know, I would get not put, not saying they're not huge names, but like I would get guys like Igor Gracie, like he's not nobody, but he's not the biggest name either. You know? So it's like, I didn't, I that was, you know, getting shocked really by another competitor. And like, I had always loved watching Andre and like Daniel, I didn't like when I fought him, I didn't have any problem because I didn't grow up watching him. He wasn't one of my like heroes. I didn't really, You know what I mean? Like, nah, I like Marcelo. And um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, go back to Marcelo. I fought when I fought Marcelo and I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I was winning that match from one sweep up into the point where he beat the piss out of me. And then uh, that was like the last 30 seconds. He caught me in a, his mounted choke that guillotine he does. Mm-hmm. And then I just remember escaping his mount and still being choked and be like, fuck, you know, it's like, <laughs> what? And so uh, I I lost to Marcelo in that round. And then I fought Andre and I was still a little bit, you know, in that like uh, awe star shock. First of all, just that I'm in ADCC, that I'm even in a medal round. Like I was just so like, I get a medal no matter what. Like, (laughs) I was just so excited and I fought him much better. I I put him in a triangle right off the bat. Right when we started the match, I was, uh, I was able, you know, he didn't submit me. It was just a lot of, uh, he, he definitely scored and positioned me, but he just, I was able to, I think Nogi gave me the little edge, you know, that little bit of a level the playing field a little bit, but um, he definitely, I mean, I, you know, not, not to the point where I felt like I won. He definitely, you know, he beat me. So uh, that was it. And I took fourth and that was my ADCC 2007 experience right in Trenton, New Jersey. Now this <laughs> was the bonus of being in Trenton. At one point on Saturday or Sunday night, because they advised us to not leave the hotel because it's not safe outside. And <laughs> there in the lobby was, I mean, I couldn't tell you I mean, if I'm just going to make up a number. I don't know. Anywhere from like 60 to 80 chairs in a circle. And it's everybody in the tournament and everybody who's a who's who. And, you know, there's Hinzo, there's Vanderlei, there's Pano, there's. You know, there's Marcelo. There's just everybody is in this circle. And I just remember I, you know, I got to sit in that circle and it was just, it was huge. And it was just, you know, having other high level guys, I guess, you know, who guys I look up to who are now just, you know, kind of shooting the shit and teasing and do, you know, having a good time. You know, it's just, I hadn't, hadn't experienced that really before. And so I just remember that really set them, you know, that it uh, really just set the, uh, kind of the moment and uh, the definitely for as far as remembering it. So it was uh, it, even though it was in Trenton, it, it I think that kept everybody inside, which gave us that cool moment. Which that gave cool you that moment. moment. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Which is and awesome because, yeah, how many people could ever say they get an opportunity to, to sit? It's one thing to compete in a tournament with that many people, but you're you're all hanging out. It's not like every other tournament you ever hear about that. Everyone's hanging out. So you guys were in a moment, you know, Man. It is high five to Mo and whoever else he's got helping him out because if you were to see the spectators, you know how he sells out now, which is mm-hmm. beautiful. There was like fucking ten people in the stands. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it be like if everybody clapped, it still sounded empty. Like it was just, yeah. it was. It was. I mean, I, I remember tripping out on that. I'm like, this is the big show. I made it, and this is this is this, this is it. <laughs> <He already." laughs> yeah, Chad, what were you gonna say? Well, I was just going to say, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had a who's who Mount Rushmore of jujitsu in their bracket for like the guys you faced, right? Like that, that's nuts. 
Pablo Popovich, uh, Bocek. I mean, there was still it was still stacked on the other side as well. Yeah, yeah, that is crazy. Mike, you said there's what at, at that time about 80, 80 competitors. Or no, more, no, no, more, more, or just in black, just in. It was just people who were involved around. The, you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's. Um, <laughs> You know, co- different countries, just all these jujitsu legends are uh, okay, okay. All right, just being in a circle with each other. Okay. And, you know, the conversation might not all be together, but sure. You know, oh, yeah. And it's being shared. How many competitors competed then in, in ADCC? Well, there's eight people per division, and what? There's five divisions for the males, or was it six? And then, um, and then what? How many? What three or four divisions for the girls, or three? I think at that time. Uh, okay, so, so that's been the same forever. So that, what I'm I'm thinking of like the you're trials. thinking of the trials. So, yeah. You're thinking okay. Of the trials. Okay. Yeah. 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 The trials are like. It's like, man, I watch these trials now. I'm like, thank God that shit's over in my yeah, life. Yeah. There's 150 <laughs> people in a yeah. bracket. <laughs> And that's like, what I, that's where I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just listening to a podcast earlier uh, with Cola Bate, you know, the young, the young kid that's lighting everybody up and he had 150 people in his bracket. It's seven, seven wins to win the, you know, the, the ticket. That's crazy. I, like Cole a lot. I got to train with him when he was like 10. Yeah. And I trained with him for about two years. And, you know, at that age, he was really growing physically as well. But yeah. I just blown away at this kid's mind at such a young age dude you dissecting my game using part of it and like even just like uh to the <clears> point <throat> where I did one of the fight to wins i think it was um i don't remember which one it was but i even i was like man you want to coach me because like dude you know my <laughs> anybody and you know i'm just yeah kid. so um you know had him coach me and like that he's just i i, I love i i'm not that person I do not love jujitsu that much, but the amount of like where he's dissecting my game, he, and the stuff he's saying is correct for, you know, as far as what I should, you know, it's like, man, you're an awesome coach competitor all around. Like, you know, I just, I just don't, uh, you know, maybe I didn't grow up with the, the, um, at that age with the amount of jujitsu that's available by the all, all different sources of media now, like, sure, yeah. but that's, it just blew me away. So man, I, I really like Cole. So shout yeah. out for Cole. Can't yeah, definitely. Yeah. Man, so the youngest was he'll be the youngest winner if he gets it. Yeah. Yeah, if he does. Yeah, yeah, that's what they were talking about because the youngest right now is Hoffa, which is one of his coaches, right? So right. he could actually break that record or whatever you want to call it, which would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. And he's I got would... a heck of a shot to do it. It's not like he's a dark horse or whatever. Not, I mean, <laughs> no, he's not. He, he's definitely somebody you know to prepare. You got to prepare for. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that's changed jujitsu so much. Like, the information we've talked about it many times on, you know, on other shows and, and Chad and I always talk about it, Mike, that, you know, it's at your fingertips more than it. Like for you, it was different for Chad. It was different. Like for me, I'm older, but I can still get on the internet and search or YouTube or whatever, watch fight to win, you know, every Friday night or not fight to win or who's number one and all that. But, um, you know, like before, like for you, it was, you guys were, I was going to say DVDs, but I'm probably going to go like VHS and he has magazines like we always talk about. So it is amazing to see that the young guys today, what their uh, mindset capacity is, you know, because they have so much information, you know, like even, oh, awesome. you know, yeah, like you're it's- like when you're coaching young kids now too, or the young, you know, it too, as well. Right. Yeah. It, the, the the amount of information that's out there is uh, it's intimidating. Like, even for myself, like people, you know, not, not and people. I, I really it's just I, I feel like it's a, a handful. But sure. um, they're like, oh, make a DVD, do the DVD on the unstoppable. And it's like I feel that I feel like there's so much shit flooded out there. I feel like I'm just a whoop, put a little drop in that bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's something about it where like I, in essence, like if Chad really wanted to learn the unstoppable. And he takes a trip to Hawaii and meets me and we do it personally and we go over it. Now he knows it, you know, and yeah. there's nothing with DVD and, uh, you know, and like in YouTube and especially if you learn it and you can use it. But I feel like, you know, I, I don't know. Do you feel warm and fuzzy to YouTube after it teaches you something? You know, it's <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even in my young journey, I've really shielded away from any kind of like any hardcore 
online content to learn anything. It's unless it's something that we're already doing in class. And then I would just want to see like a version of it or, you know, maybe a counter to something, you know, just to use it during rolling and stuff like that. But I, it's just a different mindset because I'm in my forties too. So well, it was like, yeah, go ahead. Chad. And it's, it is still a great tool because of all that information is out there, but you have, there's also a lot more higher ranks than when, you know, when I started, like my first instructor was a blue belt. Yeah, right. Same. So we watched a lot more things. And now like at our gym, myself, and we have other, we have two black belts at our gym. Wonderful. Like that's, you know, that's where we're at now. And I've told people about instructionals before, watch them take all that information. But at a certain level, instead of spending your money on that, do some private lessons with your instructor. If you want to make, you know, if you want to spend some money or, oh. you know, he knows your game, he knows yeah. what you need to work on. You really don't right now. So for me to tell you what instructional buy, it's going to be tough. Right. But I tell you, you know what I found? And, and this is, I would say, more, ah, man, I don't know if it's like, cause I, I don't want to make it sound like it's like, it's a bad thing necessarily, but I feel like more people nowadays with the amount of jiu-jitsu available, try to take their own training into their own hands. They no longer want one instructor. They want a couple. They want to be able to go between a few gyms and they want to yep. be, and, and it's like, in essence, there should be nothing wrong with that to a certain degree, but it's like, you know, like, I, you know, it's like you were to go to school to learn about the brain and then you supplement it with some other knowledge. I, I, I'm not going to shame you for that. That's, that's fucking that's cool. That's great. Right? Yeah. Oh. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's a hard one because um, I even have a, um, a student, one or two students who cross train at, another, at other gyms and um, it can provide, uh, you know, I get that they get what they need, but it can make for some awkward situations for myself because mm -hmm. I feel like minded and like um like i had a guy and he's a sweetheart he's awesome but he got his blue belt from the other instructor and, and you know and it was like dude you've only been with me like if we go by the numbers i'm the third fastest american to get the black belt and you just got your blue belt faster than i did so <laughs> uh, I'm, am i missing something you know yeah, but, right sure. <laughs> but it wasn't his fault you know what is you know how is he to know that the other instructor shouldn't have done that. You yeah, know what I mean? Sure. Just, yeah. And it's imagine this, the other instructor, I don't think he realized he's training with me all the time because it's like, imagine you have you, you're showing a guy just basic guard openings. And then for like four to five months or four months, he comes and trains with me. So when he comes back to you, yeah, he's better, but not from you. And so, sure. and so yeah. you know, he, gave, he gave one of my guys a blue. And so it's like, we did, you know, I let him keep it. And it's, it's not that big, you know, in my mind, blue at that for the, what the whole situation, it ain't that big of a deal. Not enough to lose him and, and yeah. make him feel like he's not welcome somewhere or anything like that. Uh, however, it did bring up the conversation. Like, you know, you, we got, you know, you got to give somebody the right to do the, you know, like yes. you got, who are you putting, you know, because I got to know too, because, when I'm coaching or when I'm putting effort into teaching and correcting and uh, you know, how in depth do I need to go with you? If X amount of, you know, the in depth ain't coming back from me either, sure. you know, yeah. I'm not going to put in a hundred percent just for you to, to take pick and choose what you like and then go get something from somewhere else. But, um, but luckily, you know, it wasn't <laughs> that big of a deal, but it's just some, it's, it's not, you know what I mean? Like, and I, when I think about it, it's like, it, it's not that big of a deal. It was like, why, why should I be upset? Is it something about me? Is it my old school mentality? You know, right. are we supposed to screw up and lock the doors? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, that's a, it's a fine line. Like you said, that old school mentality where it wasn't cross training or whatever, but, um, and I love that the crowd, but we've had this happen before, um, with guys training at a couple gyms. Right. And I'm old. That's cool. Whatever. Um, and we've said on this show before, like you have to have a home, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you have to have that awkward conversation like, hey, who's doing what here? I don't care what you do, but it's not fair to me or that other instructor to not know, right? And that's exactly so, what I told you. Like, you got to keep the doors open for both of us and let us yeah. know. As, as like, you know, I was like, you know, it's almost sound like a, like a girlfriend, like, does, did he know about me? <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So how'd you pop your knee, man? Just training in general or? So my claim to fame for my personal self and what I love is the butterfly hooks. And I love butterfly guards so much that I, uh, I do exercises strictly for my hip flexors and groin. Um, 
I feel to the point where I've made my leg so strong that I, I've made it stronger than it can support. And so now when I pick up butterfly sweet 200 pound men, I do get away with it a few times, but then my knee started to give way. You know, I would get the sweep and at the peak of it, the knee would collapse or lock up. Mm. And, uh, and it just was a feel from overuse. And even when it happened, it didn't happen on anybody heavy. It's just, I rely on that butterfly guard so much. Um, and then uh, it feels really good. So I was rolling and, and I didn't think about it. And one of my students stood up in the guard and I just didn't unlock my legs and my own body weight with a closed guard, him standing, supporting, you know, my weight. Oh supporting. yeah. 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 It locked it up and it wasn't, it wasn't a bad lockup and I, you know, it, it, it came undone real fast and I was able to walk around, but it just, even today, like if I turn too fast, like, <clears throat> Ooh, I don't like that. So I need to give it a rest for a few days and I need to buy a, buy a proper brace for it and just i'm actually uh um i'm would like to start getting into uh i was watching the knees over toes guy someone had recommended him oh like, yeah months ago to me about my knee and then i just saw him again on joe rogan so it's like a, it keeps getting thrown in my face so i feel like i need to do something so i'm gonna try out some of those exercises and see uh see what happens anything to avoid surgery i was gonna say and it can't hurt now like because you already yeah. know like you know where you're at so you know, investigating yeah. something else, like more, or you know, more holistically versus doing surgery. You know, sure. you, you know what that's like. Surgery means no mat time for wow. who knows yeah. how long. <laughs> right. Exactly. So <clears throat> that's cool. Very cool, man. So you wrestled in high school too, right? Yes, sir. I, uh, not, I wasn't very good at it, but, uh... <laughs> Hey man, I'm with you. I wrestled too. I wasn't very good. I mean it, but it all came back to me, even though I was off the mat for 35 years or something like that before <laughs> I, it did give me a fantastic jujitsu base, but uh, my particular wrestling career was just god awful. It was just it started off bad. I was <laughs> I was in my seventh grade math class, and my teacher uh, she asked me just was just chit chatting, and she's like, "What sports do you?" I was like, "I don't do anything." She's like, "Why didn't you wrestle this year?" And I was like, "I don't even know what wrestling is." <laughs> and she's like, "You'd be good at it because she I'm like a little short, stocky kid." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." So the next year I took her advice. I went and I tried out. So I showed up at the wrestling practice. I don't know what you do. I've, I've never tried out for a sport before, so I don't know what you do. So I just showed up to this wrestling tryout and they're like, all right, go with that kid. And they made me wrestle this other kid. And I don't know what wrestling is. So I just stood there pretty much while this other kid grabbed me through me and I cracked my collarbone. Oh, and, oh man. I mean, that was all in a matter of like five minutes of showing up. And I was like, all right. And then, um, <laughs> My mother, the, the sweet woman she was, she's like, oh, well, I don't get off work for two hours, so just hang out. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm just sitting there, this bent, it didn't break, but it bent, and it was cracked. And uh, just sitting there with that bent collarbone, and then, uh, you know, got it taken care of, and it was just wear a brace for a little while. Like, there really was no, you know, it was just pull your shoulders back. That was all the really answer was for it. But, um so that was eighth grade. Then ninth grade came around. It's like, all right, let's try this crap again. And uh, there was no cuts. So I just made the team. And I got to learn how to wrestle. And the coach, as hard as he was, was likable. Like, he had a good personality. You could tell he cared. He, as hard as he was, you never found – you didn't think it was because he was a dickhead. You just knew he was what, trying to push you hard. Sure. And uh, I loved him to death. He was, uh, coach Michaels was just fantastic – and I mean, so fantastic. This is my career. And this is how, and then the fact that I stayed with it was purely because of him. Uh, my very first match was JV. I won in double overtime. Wow. If you imagine a JV wrestling match and the, just the ability to make it into overtime <laughs> and then a double overtime, how bad both of us were. <laughs> it, it's flopping on each other. But I won. And then there was nobody at that weight for 119, 125. There was nobody at those two weights at our, our school for varsity. So I made varsity and I got beat in a matter of seconds, every single match of the whole team of the whole, you know, the whole this, the season. And then when the time came for the districts where you go, you know, you go against each other, you know, all in that, that tournament at the end, uh, a kid put me in a reverse triangle and choked me. So I actually tapped out. Wow. And the, oh, my, wow. it was like, we didn't know you could tap out in wrestling. I was like, I didn't know either, but I was just joking. <laughs> I was not, not seen wrestling. So I, I seen like WWF. So I knew you could. Yeah. And uh, 
So that, I love the coach, but that set the tone. I was like, I suck at wrestling. We're not doing this again. <laughs> and 10th grade, I didn't wrestle. I didn't want to do it. And then 11th grade, uh, my a, a group of friends I was hanging out with, they wrestled and they would do um, like the intramural, like the USA wrestling stuff. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. training with them and learning like, learning like that was, I loved it. And I would do the tournaments. I would fucking kick ass too. I was, I mean- 11th grade I just all of a sudden now I went on a team and now I'm like now I'm like somebody I can do this shit but I'd already at that point when I re got into it I'd already been cutting weight for nearly four months before the season started and now the season started and I was supposed to go even lower and it's like nah Nah. and I bailed and so senior year came around and the same situation happened I got all stoked and went into the uh intramural uh, the USA wrestling again this time when senior year started, I came out fifth in the state and right when the season started. And I was like, oh, like now I'm doing good. But the same thing, again, the weight they wanted me to go was I could I just I couldn't do more than three or four months of it. And the, with the way they would try to make these college style wrestling practices and <clears> I just, <throat> I'm over. I just uh, didn't. It just made me hate wrestling. And I didn't. And it wasn't the same coach. By the time I came back, it was the other guy, you know, and it was okay. didn't really enjoy him. Didn't really want to wrestle for him. He was never, you know, never fun to be around. I only went because I enjoyed some of the guys that wrestled. And um, and then shortly after that, I graduated, went to culinary school and I would still go back to the high school uh, during this time to train because they had like a two time a week club where the wrestlers would meet and like teach and do stuff with, little, you know, the kids and. Uh, one of the referees who would bring his kids also was a blue belt and he's just would start doing arm bars on us. And one day he's like, man, just come check out the gym. And then I came and checked out the gym and that was when the love began. Then that's it. Slowly yeah. signed myself up to college and started doing jujitsu full time. <laughs> and the rest is history. No, I'm just that kidding. <laughs> hey man. So did the passion of culinary arts cooking, like, did it stay with you or did it come back, you know, it like does. later on? <laughs> And I never, I never stopped cooking. I just stopped the schooling. And I think I learned more in the restaurants that I worked in than I ever sure. did. In, but um, <clears throat> school, I did learn a lot by all means. But I also learned that it, the, that particular school wasn't, I feel like they focused on making everything about being in a restaurant. And I get that is a mm, big part okay. of culinary arts. But no, there, you can do other stuff. You, oh, can be yeah. a partner, you can just cook at home. You know what I mean? Like it don't. Yeah. yeah. So focused on being in a restaurant that uh, that, I mean, they even asked, "What? Like, why don't you go to a different school?" Like, oh shit, my bad. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) uh, I uh, I signed myself out and just started training jiu-jitsu full time. Um, Luckily, I was paying for the college. I had won some scholarships and culinary competitions, but um, I had to pay all the back. And I I was able to pay for everything, but. uh, yeah, I actually, um, what, in 2017, 2016, I opened a food truck and had that for a little bit. So nice. I still, I still, that. nice. That's awesome. What? I actually thought about, I was never that guy was going to go to college. I knew I wasn't going to, but I kicked around the idea of going to culinary school. I still like to cook. So it's, it's, it's a good time. I feel, uh, especially if you're not working in a restaurant, that's the next best place to learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just felt that I got I got lucky with the restaurants I worked at with just having awesome chefs around, yeah. just willing to, you know, hey, watch this because you know the better they make me, the better I work with them. And you know, it was I think they I think at that time too because I was like really young, fourteen to seventeen when I did most of my cooking. Um, being so young and getting like manager type positions at that age and being able to handle like manager type position, you know, just being able to handle myself in the kitchen period at that age, I think everyone took a liking to me. So I got really, they, you know, everyone was willing to help and teach. Right. It's awesome. It helps to have that passion too, like, like jujitsu, like, just like jujitsu. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can coach someone who wants to be coached, who wants to learn and doesn't, right. you know, and then culinary arts is very much. So I cooked a lot, uh, growing up. And, um, when I got, that was like kind of my job, I carried out groceries for a while and then moved on to restaurants. So I, I learned a lot of my cooking. I still love to cook today, except I try to keep that, you know, away from all the sweets and stuff, but yeah. <laughs> you know, like cooking in a restaurant, I always tell people all the time, like, you don't have to go to culinary school, look at on TV. There's so many um, unbelievable chefs out there in the world that have blown everyone away and their home cooks, or they started out teaching themselves or they traveled and learned the culinary arts from all over, from every culture that they could. And, you know, put it into something, opened up a food truck or, you know, 
Mike gives me an idea. You can open up a jujitsu themed restaurant or a food truck <laughs> <laughs> and sell stuff like that. Right. Restaurant where everybody kind of sweats in your food a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My wife would not like that. <laughs> she's still, she's still like all the time she goes, I don't know how you do this. Like it's been two years, almost two years. And she's like, you like sweat on other guys. Like, and they sweat on you. It's really weird. Your and I'm mouth. like in your mouth. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> your eyes. Yeah. And then my eight-year-old says, I love it. <laughs> on down Chad's beard and then onto your eye. <laughs> I, I've had it not off of Chad, but I've had other people. I, we were just talking about it before we started recording. And I was like, man, I was sweating so bad. The, and just like, I look down and I always feel bad. Like if I'm on top or knee on belly or something, and I'm, I'm a little high and my face is just pouring on their face. And I'm like, well, this is kind of an offensive move, right? <laughs> I'm raining on you. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's I'm, good though. I'm, I'm Luckily, yeah, luckily, aircon because it's uh, uh, it would be a sweaty mess for me otherwise. Well, you guys are warm there all the time, man. I mean, you're, you're it better. is, but you would be surprised. Like when I, I like I said, I came from old school. We didn't have aircon. Sure, here. Like, right. Boys have aircon randomly when it worked, and it would just be fucking hot. So we would always have the fans on in there. And then when I got this spot that I'm in now, I. Uh, I didn't want to pay for the, the aircon. It was too big of a unit. It powered, it was a, like, imagine they split a room, a massive room in two, but one air conditioning unit does all of it. So there was yeah. no way to split it. So I'm like, uh, I'm not okay. paying off. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so I had it hot, but then whenever someone moved into the front and they needed the air conditioning and now we have to have it on, oh, it's become so wonderful. And now all the students cry if it goes off. <laughs> That's good for them though. I mean, you learn because, and I'm speaking from old school because I don't, I think it's more comfortable for people who train certain ways now than maybe 25 years ago or 20 years ago. <laughs> but well, there was an I, old, go ahead, Mike. Well, but I sweat a lot. It's bad. And so <laughs> I wear, I wear double weaves because it soaks up the sweat a little better. So I'm not uh, a wet mess. Oh yeah. And the air con helps me roll a little longer, but if I go to it, like I just sweat. So, I mean, I can, you know, five, 10 pounds in a session ain't nothing. Wow. That's what it's I need. Miserable. Can we do that at East coast? Chad, can we, I need to do what? that. <laughs> if I read a book fast, I start sweating. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. Very good stuff. Hey it man, for, go ahead. It just makes for a great dynamic within sleeping. Like my fiance, she's covered up. I'm on top of the covers. Just almost just, about to die. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that. that's good hey man what do you think the uh the biggest misconception is with jujitsu um man i don't know if i could repeat what i heard last night i was getting gas and uh well went to the grocery store saw one of my students and uh and she was getting food for dinner and whatever and then i went to go get gas and she was getting gas as well so i was like <laughs> oh follow me around you know just chit-chatting and then the guy next to her I can't see him because his vehicle's blocking, but he notices her gi and he's, uh, she's still in her gi pants or whatever. And he was talking about, uh, she's like, Oh, you do that jujitsu. And she's like, yeah, she's like, you know, um, you should come try. He's like, nah, I was raised different than that. You know, I don't know. That, that ain't right. You know, those guys, they roll. And it was like, I could just hear the conversation. I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> which that misconception right there. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like for me, it's like, I want to, I, I, I didn't want to say anything because I feel like there's no way I could come across and not be, you know, almost rude in that moment. Like yeah. I wanted to yeah. help her out as far as like kind of defend what jujitsu is, but it's also like, I'm just going to create a scene. And so, um, he keeps on, but it's like, if I, I almost want to ask him, it's like, what do you think we do in there? Yeah. Like, right. you, you do realize this is a, it's like, it's, it's a safe way to practice like physical fighting. Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there's a sweaty guy involved. There's <laughs> sweaty ladies and there's everybody and there's, you know what I mean? Kids do this and they, it's like, I have a 74 year old, like, you know what I mean? Like in my mind, nice. like, what do you say? That's awesome though. Yeah, it's like, yeah. what do you say? You know, so, because, you know, in my mind, I'm already, def you know, I'm defensive for jujitsu and like being, just being open sure, to it. Sure, like, right. But they, that is one that just comes right off the my, my mind because it's, you know, I don't, I don't, in my, and I think I'm naive. I would like to assume that not nah, people don't think like that, but you know, I've just proved wrong again last night. And yes. <laughs> and so uh, I think if it, the biggest misconception would be just the, uh, I 
it's and the thing is, it's not a misconception. It is intimate. It is a it is a intense. It can you know there's there's shedding of the ego. I, 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 it would just be nice if people were able to give it more of a chance, like doing it before yeah. they accept their opinion, um, because sure. their opinion is not wrong, but it's not right in the sense of what they're thinking. You know, it's like you know it it you you know it's uh, you know like I said I just uh, I don't know if there's a a right way to go about it, but um, that's the that would be the biggest thing. You know, I invite some parents and like, hey, you know, you should jump in. You're in good shape. You should do this. You know, sure. even if they're not trying to make them feel good and uh and they're like oh no i'm you know one guy's like i'm 36 you know i'm too i'm like dude i just turned 39 like what are you trying to say <laughs> like, right <laughs> you know like and that's what i say like i have a 74 year old if what do you think we do you know like if you yeah. see him here you know obviously he's surviving he's not broken you know he has a smile on his face still sure, and yeah. so that would be i think just the the I think people have that misconception and all whatever vision they have a misconception of, of jujitsu, whether it be too violent or, um, you know, whether they feel they have some, uh, you know, like homophobia about it or whatever their their reason might be. I feel excuse me. I just wish it would uh, it wasn't interpreted, you know, so in that direction first with some people. Yeah. You know, oh, I, I feel- you know, and, you know, even some of the ladies that have come into class, it took someone to convince them to come in because, you know, their perceived thought was just like, oh, I can't do it. I'm going to get beat up or whatever right. they were thinking. Like when they get in here, it's like, that's not what this is at all. Like, it's amazing. And, you know, they yeah. have a great work. You know, they love that. You know, now they change their work schedules for it and bring their family. And it's uh, and so, you know, it just I would like people to see that side first. So that's but that's the environment I try to create in my gym. So. Oh, that's good on you, man, because you know what it's like. I mean, Chad and I have talked about it many times and with many of our other guests about, you know, it's a big deal walking into a gym. It's huge. It's hard for people to walk into a gym. And one of the first things you want to do is get them to understand you want them there, like accept them and, you know, that it's not going to, it could, it might be hard, but if you're training in a martial art, it shouldn't be easy in my opinion, or, or basically any sport, to be honest with you. Um, but you know what I mean? Like you want the environment to be good. And we, you know, Chad, I can, you know, tangent off of what he always says, but he preaches that to all our people all the time at our gym is, you know, that's the environment we want to create because of the original person who created that, um, Mr. Steve Hyman, that was his method forever. And that's been that way. So I know I'm being good on you to continuously, you know, do that to your students. And then eventually people will, the misconception. And I always ask that question to people like the misconception is hard because you're right. It's like, people are like, Oh, what are you doing? I've, you know, I've talked about it being misconceived on what I'm doing. Like, why are you doing jujitsu? I started at 42, (laughs) but it was something I've always wanted to do. I did all kinds of other martial arts. It was something I always wanted to do. So it was like, why would you do that? You know, what's that? what What got you in the door? Uh, I just wanted to challenge myself. So for me, it was, I'm a person that likes to push myself. Like I've done crazy things to where, you know, not an 880 mile walk, but I was like, I want to do uh fingertip pull-ups. So I spent like a year doing nothing but training my hands and training myself to do one, one pull-up just with, you know, the very, very tips of my, I, all I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it off a, so like a wood or on a yeah, yeah. entry because it was the only thinnest part. I was like, you know what? Is that even possible? I was like, I'm sure it is, but I'm 200 over 200 pound guys, 200 at the time. And I was like, yeah, you can do it. So I just kept working at it and working at it. So I'm that person. Like when I wanted to do jujitsu, it was, you know what? You got to challenge yourself. Like there's got to be a new challenge. You've always wanted to do this. Just do it. <clears throat> I walked in and then. Well, now people- I'm fingertips <laughs> <laughs> it is funny because everyone at the gym is always like, dude, you have like a ridiculous grip. Because I still I use these like all day. Like literally, I'm a desk jockey, I'm an engineer. So, but I have these all day long, all night long. And it's either I have a good grip or I Did you just, burn my just on the grip. What's going on over there? <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say? Did you just hold up a pack of sausages on the camera? Yes. <laughs> But it gets me in trouble because I'm a white belt, so I'll hold a grip too long because <laughs> I can hold it forever. And everyone's like, dude, I can't break your grip. And I'm like, but that's not a good thing because Chad's always yelling at me. Dude, let go. It doesn't help you. <laughs> that's all right. I have a lot to learn, man. That's why I that's get okay. good people. That's why I we start. That grip. Yeah. 
I know that's one thing we want to do with the podcast, like spread jujitsu, like, like change the misconception of other people out there that, you know, maybe think it's crazy or maybe think it's foul or whatever in whatever nature, because it's growing, you know, the community of jujitsu has grown huge since when you and Chad have started. Yeah. And it it is some of those things that Mike talked about and it, it is hard. It is awkward. It is intimate. It is a lot of those things, but not in a bad way. You right. just have to come in and check it out and, you know, make that first step. And and like Mike said, atmosphere is the first thing. I think I don't even, I don't even care if you think our jujitsu is good yet, that'll speak for itself. Right. Um, but it's feeling comfortable because, you know, Mike came, came up in the old days where you'd walk in a gym and you would feel that intense atmosphere or like, I don't want to be here because it's going to be a fight today or, you know, right. things like that have changed, you know, but I don't know if you're here, Terry, you, my first day, I don't know what your first day was like at Chad's, but my first day at Lloyd's was Lloyd telling me to put headgear on and try to take down one of his purple belts, Jeff Ruth, who was getting ready for a fight. So I was <laughs> like, like, that's that's day one. All right, here we go. Yeah, Dude, I'm still I'm just, when yeah. I can't believe you guys come back like because like now, could you imagine like that now? Like, hey, you walk in and you're like, uh, that guy over there, you're just going to drill him because he's, you know, he's yeah, got a huge I mean, tournament coming up this yeah, weekend. I got, I got heel hooked my first day. Like nobody, you know, I always talk about how what's changed the biggest for me in jujitsu is how we take care of each other. Right. Like back in the day, it wasn't like, Hey, if something taps hurt, you can do this. You can't do that. Now we're like very careful on how we take care of our, our new people. Right. Well, I'll tell you too, for myself, uh, as far as like, you know, why do I, why would I come back? I would say at my time at 18 and 19 years old and what I perceived was doable in the world of life. Um, like to give you an example, there was one point where I was like, I want to move to Brazil. I, I love jujitsu so much. I'm going to go down there mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to research Scott Nelson, all these guys that are going down there and see what, what did they do? How did they get down there? Let me contact them. And, and uh, I just, I, you know, I was, I loved everything about Brazil. And I remember Lloyd is like, Nope. He's like, you're not doing that. And I remember like, and that probably was a better choice by all means. Like it wasn't like he was giving me bad sure, advice, sure. Mm -hmm. but it was like, I, you're right. You know, like in my mind, I, that, that kind of thing almost didn't seem in the realm of, I, I didn't know you could quit. I didn't know I was allowed to not, not be here. Like I, you right. know, I didn't, you, you, mean, never, yeah. you mean I could leave this gym and go to another place? Like it just never crossed my mind. So like getting beat up and coming back, you know, no matter how ridiculous the training was there, it, it, you know, it, it just never dawned on me that I could ever leave. And it wasn't until I like got unhappy you know, uh, you know, like I was explaining earlier, like how I wanted to, you know, I just felt like there was something missing and it wasn't sure, until like yeah. really came around a few years later that, it, you know, it kind of, and even then when I left, I went back home, I went back to where my mom was like, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know. I didn't know. And then my first real reaching out was moving to California and then, you know, living over uh, in San Diego. And then I moved to Guam and I was like, Oh, I can live anywhere. I can, uh, but I didn't, you know, I, or I didn't say I necessarily could live anywhere, but I just knew I, I jujitsu was allowing me now to travel and see the world. And uh, it was, um, you know, it was just like, I didn't realize you could go to places without having to do a tournament and not having to leave within hours. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I didn't know right, you yeah. sure. days to go to a place. Like, sure. But it was, you know, it was just naive to it. Like, it was just, you know, in essence, and, not, and again, not in a bad way. It was like, whatever Lloyd said, I did. You know, Lloyd's like, hey, you're going to do a workout at this time. Okay. You know, he's like, gonna I was just, I mean, in essence, I feel like it wasn't my goal to be a world champion. It wasn't my goal to get my black belt in three and a half years. These were things I heard Lloyd say. And I was like, oh, that sounds good. I'll do that. Black belt in three and a half years. That sounds good. I'll do that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, what do I do? And I was just a good workhorse. You know, okay. Yeah. Girls do this, do this. And we go to the tournaments. And, you know, I earned my belt because I, you know, by brown belt, there was no other brown belts in America left to beat. Um, and I went to Brazil. I took third in the World Cup all by <clears> submission. And it was just like, all right, you know, now what am I, you know, in essence, and then that three and a half year goal, I could stay brown another year. But what is that going to do? Mm -hmm. yeah, am I just going to win more sure. of the same tournament? Yeah. You know, like, it ain't that big yet. So, and then I got my black belt. And the following weekends, I won the American Nationals. But it wasn't... Um, you know, it was, I don't know, the whole, uh, I mean, losing, even just starting to lose my train of thought, but it was just, I 
couldn't, oh, you know, again, just could not being able to really fathom having like outside the realm of jujitsu. Like, you know, I didn't know you could move places and like start yeah. a gym. Like, you know, none of these things like really dawned on me until later in life. And, and then even trying to make, then it was like even expecting, like not saying things to be laid out for you, but then when I expected something to be laid out and then it wasn't and still making it happen. Mm, um, sure, yeah. Why it was supposed to be, went a total different direction than what the original plan was. And, um, and you know, it's, it set up a whole different dynamic that, you know, got us where we're at today. It could be totally different had it gone the original way it was planned as far as, um, you know, the guys I was supposed to be teaching and working with and, and you know, I ended up coming in and it was like, I thought we were all supposed to be doing mm -hmm. like this one gym and all of a sudden everyone split and it's like, uh oh. And then I just, I was just brought here to teach. I don't know what the fuck, I, you know, I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> right, like, right. You hate who? Wait, why? You hate this guy? Man, I, I don't want to know that. Y'all get yeah. this no trick, you know? Sure. And it's, uh, yeah, but you, you know, like your time when you started, though, like you were all in. That's what, and that's what you knew, which yeah. is good. Like that work ethic, and it's hard. You can't teach. I, it, I always tell my kids, I have three kids. I'm like, you can't teach work ethic. Like you have to see it, and you have to be willing to do it. And you were yeah. at that time. And even though things have changed over time, but look where you're at now. So you're still, you're still training, and you're still giving people the great knowledge of jujitsu, which. I say it a million times. People are like, Terry, don't talk about that. It's the greatest martial art on the planet. So <laughs> I always say that, man, when you were in Guam, did you train in Guam? I mean, did they, and this is just because I have no idea. They, they trained jujitsu they, in they Guam? Do. There is a lot of jujitsu on Guam. A okay. Lot, lot. Uh, when I got there, um, the, uh, the gyms were still growing and there wasn't a lot. And I wasn't, I, I didn't go out there like, I'm going to go to Guam. It was, they had contacted, um, about bringing Barrett Yoshida out to train and Barrett couldn't make it. And one of Barrett's students or friends who was also my student was like, Oh, you know, Mike Fowler is here. He can probably go. And so uh, I went and visited for, um, a little bit and I was teaching class out there. And the, the guy who ran the gym was a brown butt at the time. And so, um, you know, and it was open, all, it was just really, really nice and welcoming. And they, uh, you know, if you ever come, you know, always joking, like, oh, you should stay, you should stay. And then it worked out to where I was like two weeks later after I left, I was like, yo, I can kind of come back. And so I uh, went out there and I started, um, you know, teaching full time and, um, you know, uh, the gym, the level of that gym continued to rise. I mean, it was rising with or without me, but at least with, uh, you know, good some good structure and you know curriculums and things like that and some organizing um it just made those guys just they are a force to be dealt with they're awesome you know and uh it's just so far away from the mainland you know it's just such a hard thing to get you know to go you know sure. to, oh to yeah editor regularly you got to go to japan you got to go to philippines like you get a different sense of competition because it's just a different side of the world and um but it was beautiful it's awesome and they you know and nowhere nowhere was free of drama and politics you know this gym sometimes didn't like this gym or mm, you know yeah. this gym broke away and they you know it's the same thing everywhere and um uh what i did like is the local heroes from each gym kind of got to stand out a little more so it was almost like not like superheroes but you would you would hear of most of the the better guys on island and and they would, you know, it was just the island was very supportive of them. And it was just really cool to see people get lifted up. And, uh, you know, um, jujitsu is really embraced there. And that, not just jujitsu, I mean, and, and multi, you know, a lot of things. I mean, I, Guam's one of the most artistic places I've ever been. There's a lot of art there, a lot of artists. Oh, nice. And uh, it's just awesome. And so I, I really enjoyed my time there. And then, so yeah, they've got jujitsu. They've got their own competitions. I actually fought one of my biggest competitions there. I fought Keenan Cornelius back in like 2015 there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I fought Hinger. I fought Josh Hinger first round. And then I fought one of the local guys from Guam second round. And then I ended up fighting <laughs> Keenan. And uh, Keenan choked me out. He well, didn't choke me out, but he, you know, he choked me. I tapped as a, uh, but awesome fight really good really good with him it was really just a mistake at the end when he caught the choke and you know solidified everything but uh that was just awesome you know out of every out of everywhere in the world to get the fight keen and that was the spot so that was cool that's yeah, really that's, cool again adding to the you know the who's who and then you go oh yeah well i had this match in guam so <laughs> <laughs> where no one like where no one ever like gets an opportunity to compete or you know can say that obviously so. well i love where i'm at in my jiu-jitsu path as far as the age because i was fortunate enough to get to compete with henzo and solo and yeah. 
uh, you know, there's a, some, maybe not as big names, but just being around some of these guys because they hadn't quite left the scene yet. Sure. And then also enough to fight the next crop, you know, and then, yeah. you know, the group I came up with, you know, I fought Bill Cooper, I fought Jeff Glover. I got, you know, I've, yeah. we, we've, you know, we've gone through all these, um, uh, you know, the, you know, as the, I got to go through all the names and all the generations almost, maybe not the newest ones. I think the last one, you know, but I've got to fight Keenan. I got to, you know, at least I got to train with the Mendez brothers. I fought Andre. And I got, yeah. I've had such a wide array of sharing the map. I think I've fought seven Gracies, you know, yeah. um, so it's, uh, you know, and just in our history alone of jujitsu, I feel, uh, I feel accomplished, you know, uh, and the, you know, the guys you've trained, you know, trained with day to day, Ryan Hall and JT and those guys, right. I mean, well, Ryan, I trained with quite a bit, but Ryan was when I was a purple and brown, Ryan was a blue. And, okay. So a little behind. Yeah. The last year, like two years, maybe um, I was there at Lloyd's, but um, I think Ryan was a purple belt when I left Yeah, and then um, Ryan still continued. And JT actually, JT, my first time meeting him, I was already living in Guam and JT okay. got sent out. So yeah, I was like in 08. So I was a black belt for about three years already. And then JT, I think he joined Lloyd's at Brown. And gotcha. then and then he, you know, that trained again. And oh man, that that went from I only had a, a few fun times. And I say fun times, that's just where I won. I only had a few <laughs> times in that beginning of the JT relationship where I was able to beat him in roles because man, he cut he came up so fast. He did yeah. He, it was just, uh, you know, it was just trying at one at, at the end. It was just like, I hope you don't get this fucking grip. Like, I, you know what I mean? It's, it was just, <laughs> certain things now, but it was just like, he's too good. It was, uh, he was really fun to train with and such a good guy. Really yeah. loved Jake. Super nice guy. We've had him out for seminars a couple of times. So nice. Yeah, he's a he's a good one. Yeah. yeah, I've heard every every. I mean, all the guys at the gym that were able to be at that um at that seminar, they always talk well and t- talk highly of him. So, very cool, good stuff, man. We kept you. Yeah, we're we're over an hour we, of your life that you're never getting back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everyone, hey. listen to the show. Keep <laughs> listening to the show. <laughs> hey, man. So, did you have to train for the for that walk? Like when you walked in Japan, did you train for it, or you would just? <laughs> recommended i do some things and okay. I, yeah, I did i did um i didn't <laughs> <laughs> so me, he's like you need to like get a heavy sack and just practice just to get used to what it's gonna feel like and i think sure. i did it one time and i was like yep yeah, that's gonna that's just gonna be what it is and it's gonna it's not gonna feel good until yeah. i do it it's gonna suck and, <laughs> yeah and uh man that the it was amazing the physical body, the mental part, the connection, because there was times when I would walk and my feet would hurt so bad by the end of the day. And it was like, when I got to the spot that I was going to sleep at or for whatever it was going to be, it was like, my feet knew we're done walking and we're not Mm. doing no more. And so they would like triple, they would just, I, it was like, I had to like, like gingerly walk from the bed to the toilet or something. You know, I I just, it was, so painful when I would stop walking. And then when I would wake up, the pain would be gone. It would be back almost to normal. And then until the end of the day, again, depending on how much, you know, pressure and time was put on, you know, those, you know, miles or whatever it was that day, it would just, it was like every time that I stopped walking, like when I got to where I was going, my feet knew they were done and they were not going to do anymore. And uh, by the end, there's no doubt in my mind that I had like stress fractures from how fast I was going and how hard Mm. I was pushing. Cause then when I stopped walking, when I was done, my feet swelled up and felt broken. Like they were just fattish. They were just oh, super, okay. both feet were swelled. Uh, it, 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 it actually felt better when they were swollen because it held them together. Oh, as man. soon as they came unswollen, it was the hardest to walk. <clears throat> oh man. Oh yeah. <clears throat> but, Still, uh, it's gotta be one of the greatest experiences ever though. Like, Oh yeah. I mean, priceless memories. Uh, I mean, What's the greatest thing you saw, you think, from an uh, art standpoint? Because Japan just so beautiful. Man, some of the temples, like one that stuck out was uh, famous because it's actually built into the mountain. So you climb, I don't know how many steps, like, you know, something ridiculous, like 3,000. You get to the top. It's one of the few temples that old people can't drive up to. Oh, wow. Okay. And they actually have to take that little 3.2 kilometer hike up the stairs and... Uh, 
But when you get to see it, like just the beauty and the architecture and then the fact that it's like in the mountain, like it's blended, like it's built into the actual mountain. So the mountain and the temple can be prayed to and worshiped as one. Like that was, I mean, just some of the build, they, you know, those were amazing things. Um, there was like, you know, serendipitous, like, you know, co- like just things that I would call out that would happen. And uh, so much to the point that like it reaffirmed the belief in a higher power. You know, I felt, a, you know, feeling a presence. Sure. Yeah. Knowing who it is, but knowing they're there and they got you, you know, and yeah. I mean, it's it was amazing and like that in that sense like when the the garb you wear it's supposed to say a few things on it and one of the things it says is there's two of you walking there's you and buddha and so you wear you have a staff that you walk with that represents buddha's foot and so you have to clean that when you go to places and Mm. you do you know there's other things besides that you have to do as well but that that staff i took a tumble on a on one of the the trails because like i said the ones that the extra temples weren't as gone to and the, t- and the trails weren't taken care of. And so there was a part where it was just kind of washed out and uh, I fell and it was one of those like, Oh shit, here we go. We're going down. <laughs> and I remember just swinging that stick out and it catching a tree. And it was like matrix. I was like completely perpendicular. I mean, parallel with the ground, like, but solid, like, you know what I mean? Like somebody's holding on and, you know, keeping you there. And then, sure. but just, and then it, it happened again and it was like that was like two times in the same little you know episode and then uh having little prayers answered within the moment or having them you know imagine here's a silly one i told ensign and a group of friends there was like i don't know seven of us i was like watch i'm gonna be walking and i'm gonna meet a hot chick and she's gonna give me food and a place to stay and she's gonna smoke weed and she's gonna <laughs> serve and i was just going off on this list on that hike I met a girl, cute girl. She was, uh, she had like a hair salon and uh, she was like, Hey, would you, and I'm wearing the garb. She's like, Hey, would you like something to eat? And I was like, sure. She's like, let's go get pizza. So she took me to go get pizza. And on the way she's like, yeah, if you want the guy who owns the shop next to me, he's helped working this festival. Let's go to the festival. He said, you can stay at his shop and spend the night. And I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, yeah, festival food. And so I call Ensign. I'm like, yeah, Ensign, I just met the hot chick who serves who uh, <laughs> gives me food and she's giving me a place to stay. He's like, did she smoke you out? I was like, don't jinx it. And, uh, <laughs> we go to the festival and then afterwards she's like, all right. So she has to go back home and she takes care of her kid and she's out. And then I go with the guy who has the, you know, the shop next door and on the back of the shop, he grew weed. And so he smoked me out, went to bed and it was like, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just stayed all, you know, <laughs> that's what it wasn't supposed to happen. But it was like, <laughs> Like, you know, and, and some that weren't silly as well, but just so many coincidental things that happened. So that trip had, it wasn't so much as beautiful things I saw, which there wasn't, there's not enough time to see them all. You can't sure. do it and see it sure. all. Right. Uh, too much. But uh, it, the feelings, the, you know, it was amazing. And it wasn't like it was like an instant, like, um, you know, for me, I had some issues I was going through and it wasn't like it was an instant fix, but it was as the year, two years went on, and those memories and those feelings kept working their magic. It was like you, you know, it's like one day again, I could like, ah, deep breath again. Wow. Yes. Cool. Yeah. You no, know, it's like one of it, it, it had its magic. I would love to go back and do it again one day. Oh, so I was going to ask you, would you ever do it again? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually the thing. Uh, people do it all the time. Like I met a guy who did it on bicycle 150 times. Wow. Uh, I met one guy who did it like over 270, but, he said over a hundred were in the car. Some were by train. Some mm, were nice. walking. You, know, you kind of do what you feel in that moment. And so, um, you know, it, it's, there's a name for going around in one shot. There's a name for going backwards. And that's supposed to be lucky. And oh, okay. then there's who also, I met one guy, he only gets like two weeks off every like six months or whatever it is, his vacation. And every year he does a portion. And then the next year he comes back and he goes off in that same spot and then nice. walks on the and so like, I thought, you know, like I said, you'll, you, you meet people who are, you know, I met one guy who did it because he survived cancer. Now he wants to live. You know, I, uh, I met another one um, who, uh, there it goes. Sorry. Yeah, I met I another guy. Uh, he um, uh, just, you know, I, in essence, just wanted to take photos. He was just taking beautiful photos. It was like, there wasn't like any spiritual meaning behind it. And if he did, he didn't translate that to me, sure. but it was just like, every, 
the reasons. And it was like, yeah. that's cool. This is like a little get, get, you know, getaway. And these old people are praying at every single temple and doing their thing. And, you know, everyone had their reasons. And, uh, it was really cool. Just awesome experience. I mean, it felt like you're in a Kung Fu movie the whole time. <laughs> Which I'm not laughing at that anyone out there listening, but it's, but anyone but you know, of our it, age, it, 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 we grew up know, watching man. that. <laughs> it's like, and, dude, you just, you wish you had like a samurai sword on you. You'd play the part. Just, you're just, yes. there, you know? you're just that's that. the coolest you're thing though. Wandering like, gaijin. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like I, like when I saw that and, you know, even to talk to you about it, like to have, like to think of your mindset when you're going through it because you're getting to absorb all that stuff and all the outside noise is slowly going away and you're just absorbing what's in you and building that, you know, whatever it is for everyone that ever does. I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know, if you have an opportunity to do something like that or engage in something like that, do it because it's only going to make you a better person, a better life. That's and that's perfect. And the biggest mis misconception I find that people think about these hikes, because I had the same one, you're not going to get lost in your thoughts. That is never the purpose. No Buddhist book will ever tell you to do that because, you know, that's a monk's mind and you go, you know what I mean? It's, yep. it's, it's rest. They make you wear bells or they, you know, you're supposed to wear bells. Sure you in the moment every single step you pay attention to what's happening right now because that's the that's the, that's the real gift is this present this yep. this you know, make sure you don't walk two kilometers and you don't even remember you know you you know how we drive and just forget yep. the mind just takes up oh yeah. yeah but but if you look at that if i had like my 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 you know my all of my life can you know and i could see it how many hours were wasted that I don't even recall because I'm fucking all, you know what I mean? My mind was sure, all somewhere right. else. Yeah. But the, the biggest thing I found is, uh, is just learning to be in the moment, not being lost in your head. You know, there's times for that, but it's not, that's not what you go for. Yeah. You know, if you were, if it was to be lost in your head, you could stay right where you're at. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's per, it's Very great. True. It's, it's a hundred percent. And it's greatly said the way that you said it yesterday is over. Tomorrow will be tomorrow. Right now is the moment that you're, you know, we're talking, we're living for right now. You know what I mean? Like, and it's awesome. Like, I think it's cool. If anyone out there listening that ever would have want to do something like that, I very much encourage you to do it. Go watch. I believe Mike, you have that stuff. Did, did you, you posted all that stuff on, uh, didn't you do a yeah, um, GoPro? I made a video mm -hmm. on my Facebook. Yeah. That's like, I mean, you have to go back and search it. I mean, uh, sure, I sure. But I, yeah, I had a video, a 30 minute video showing some of the hikes, showing some of the temples and, um, you know, it, I would say the, the, the thing that I got out of it is, is being content. Yeah. I'm That's happy. You know yeah. what I mean, I wake yeah. up every day happy, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, like I, I don't, you know, the worries aren't, they're not like, they're not there, but it's, it's different. you know what I mean? Worry it's, makes you suffer, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's like, it really, it really just changed my outlook on, you know, just how I handle situations and everything. So, I mean, it's, it, it's a beautiful thing now that I, I now I want to go back so I can really enjoy the beauty of it. Not just and that's, the, yeah, that's why I went asking her you earlier, you know, and you about going back and that's kind of what people will do. You, you know, there's stages and you could do that same thing, but you know, the first stage is like living in the moment, figuring out how to do that without all the other stuff. And the second yeah. time is then you go back and you start absorbing <laughs> everything around you and living in the moment at the same time you learn yeah. to do that mm -hmm. as you go you know it's that i'd say it's the it's an asian way of you know especially yeah. in monks and stuff like that but anyway i can always go off on tangents on this show this is what i do <laughs> <laughs> chad you got anything for mike that you want to talk about i mean we could do go forever right if we just keep talking about <laughs> i know you got some so. i know you got some dvds uh yeah, Some I was just, old. I have this, I have this binder of old DVDs, you know, back in the day when we would just like burn copies and find them on the internet and stuff. So I was showing Terry, I have your Nogi Made Easy series. The one with, Wait, uh, Nogi's Ryan Easy? <laughs> Ryan? Okay. Say it again. Go ahead, Mike. Is it Ryan or JT? I think it's Ryan. I think, Ryan? Okay. I think so. Yeah, I think I'll have to, I, it's been a while. There's probably dust on it. I'll have to dust it off. That was fun. It was fun filming with uh, Ryan was fun to film with, but Ryan's not like engaging as far as like um, conversation, as far as like goofing off as much. Back oh, then. right. <laughs> JT, JT was he was a good one to, to he's just he's oddly funny about the stuff he is funny about. And it was just it was a yeah. good time doing those DVDs. Yeah, good time. That's yeah. awesome. Good. Stuff. I have one of my uh, one of my brown belts. Brad still runs your unstoppable sweep like crazy. It's his favorite sweep. 
Me so. too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, man, uh, do this, Mike. Shout out where anyone can uh, get to you and um, and anything else you want to. If you got any sponsors or your gym there in Hawaii or whatever or wherever, anything you want. Oh, man, I just, uh, if anything, uh, if you're ever in Hawaii and you're on Oahu, we're on the North Shore. Uh, we're at the post office. So if you just go to Haleva post office, there's no way you won't, you won't miss us. Um, and there's, we, we, we have a, a no match fee for visitors it's already expensive enough to come here so we appreciate <laughs> it. um just be happy and you don't have to bring your pocketbook or anything or you know wallet you're it's uh I, I like to remind you know i think our visitors you know uh, sometimes are intimidated because it's already so expensive to be here and then like you know i can only imagine what aoj's visitor fee is now but it, you know what i mean it, yeah it, yeah it, we don't just want to let people know that, you know, we, uh, we're open doors for visitors. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to make my, my rent off the, off the people that visit and just want to come say hello. So if right. you're ever here, you're more than welcome to train as much as you want. Um, within reason, like you moved here, didn't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's really, it. we don't have any really drilled gym sponsors. We have a few people that we you know work with a lot and I love on the mat and Scott Nelson. And I love the yeah. work he's doing with his hospital that, uh, yeah. I think, uh, and um he uh uh he just does great things for everyone uh I, that's a, that's an awesome dude and, and we actually uh, we actually have him lined up for a podcast in a couple weeks oh so i i can't wait to I, i'll definitely tune in to hear that one i yeah i i like scott a lot he's uh he's just great for jujitsu and um kayo kimonos k-a-y-o kimonos uh it's a wonderful couple in the in missouri and uh, they do all of our uniforms and our, you know, stickers and geese and rash guards and everything that we nice. need. They always they do a fantastic job taking care of us. And so uh, if you, uh, their Instagram's the same handle, Kyle Kimonos, and uh, you can always contact me while I, I share their stuff frequently. Um, and then what else? That's really about it. Uh, that's, we don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I've gotten out of my phase of NASCARing out my geese. So we uh, <laughs> yeah. don't really flash any one person over the other. It's just, if you're supportive of the gym, we try to show the support back and, sure. uh, you know, if possible. And um, so, uh, but man, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you uh, having me on and uh, I look sure, forward man. to uh, thanks episode when it gets out. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, man, for coming on and hanging out and just having a good time. Appreciate it so much. And uh Keep up the great work and everything you're doing, man. Godspeed and forward and upward and onward, right? I have a question. Does yeah. uh, Chad's like camera angle, does he get smaller as the years go on, as the beard gets bigger? Because you have to fit his whole beard in the in the. Picture? It does. <laughs> I might have to keep <laughs> tilting it down a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> He's back here to get it in. That's a very I good. Think- that, that's great. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if you remember, Mike, but I met you in Indiana at James Klingerman when James Klingerman brought you. And yeah. that's who I'm, that's who I'm a black belt under, but I oh, walked James. in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So James is who I got my black belt from. Um, but I came down, I drove down and I walked in. You're like, I thought Richie Martinez was here. That's the first thing you said to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not cool too. <laughs> <laughs> that was before the beard, right? Or did no. you have the beard? No, no, oh, I had the beard. Yeah. You had the big beard. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're thinking of Geo. I'm probably. thinking of Geo. Yeah, but yeah. Richie still, ha- yeah, sure. Richie's That's beard is. Yeah, I would not mistake him for Geo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Very well, cool. hey, dude, take care, man. Uh, bless yes. you and everything and your family and everything you got going on. Cool. We'll see All you down right, the road, sure. guys. Happy New Year. Yes. Ha- thanks, thanks, brother. Man. Happy New Year to you too. All right, later. <laughs>